We're beginning chapter 12 of C.S. Lewis's The Horse and His Boy. It's called Shasta in Narnia, and I'm Terry Bybo Knight, your reader. Was it all a dream, wondered Shasta, but it couldn't have been a dream, for there in the grass before him he saw the deep, large print of the lion's front right paw. It took one's breath away to think of the weight that could make a footprint like that. But there was something more remarkable than the size about it. As he looked at it, water had already filled the bottom. Soon it was full to the brim and then overflowing, and a little stream was running downhill past him over the grass. Shasta stooped and drank, a very long drink, and then dipped his face in and splashed his head. It was extremely cold and clear as glass and refreshed him very much. After that he stood up, shaking the water out of his ears and flinging the wet hair back from his forehead and began to take stock of his surroundings. Apparently it was still very early morning. The sun had only just risen and it had risen out of the forests which he saw low down and far away on his right. The country which he was looking at was absolutely new to him. It was a green valley land dotted with trees through which he caught the gleam of a river that wound away roughly to the northwest. On the far side of the valley there were high and even rocky hills, but they were lower than the mountains he had seen yesterday. Then he began to guess where he was. He turned and looked behind him and saw that the slope on which he was standing belonged to a range of far higher mountains. I see, said Shasta to himself. Those are the big mountains between Archenland and Narnia. I was on the other side of them yesterday. I must have come through the pass in the night. What luck that I hit it. Uh, at least it wasn't luck at all, really, it was him. And now I'm in Narnia. He turned and unsaddled his horse and took off its bridle, though you are a perfectly horrid horse, he said. It took no notice of this remark and immediately began eating grass. That horse had a very low opinion of Shasta. Wish I could eat grass, thought Shasta. It's no good going back to Anvard, it'll all be besieged. I'd better get lower down into the valley and see if I can get anything to eat. So he went on downhill, the thick dew was cruelly cold to his bare feet, till he came into a wood. There was a kind of track running through it, and he had not followed this for very many minutes when he heard a thick and rather wheezy voice saying to him, well, Good morning, neighbor. Shasta looked round eagerly to find the speaker, and presently saw a small prickly person with a dark face who had just come out from among the trees. At least it was small for a person, but very big indeed for a hedgehog, which was what it was. Good morning, said Shasta, but I'm not a neighbor. In fact, I'm a stranger in these parts. Ha, huh? said the hedgehog inquiringly. I've come over the mountains from Archenland, you know. Ha, huh? Archenland, said the hedgehog. That's a terrible long way. Never been there myself. And I think perhaps, said Shasta, someone ought to be told there's an army of savage calamines attacking Envard at this very moment. You don't say so, answered the hedgehog. Well, think of that. And they do say that Kellerman is hundreds and thousands of miles away, right at the world's end, across a great sea of sand. It's not nearly so far as you think, said Shasta. And oughtn't something to be done about this attack on Anvard? Oughtn't your high king to be told? Certain sure, something ought to be done about it, said the hedgehog. But you see, I'm just on my way to bed for a good day's sleep. Hello, neighbor. The last words were addressed to an immense biscuit-colored rabbit whose head had just popped up from somewhere behind the path. The hedgehog immediately told the rabbit what it had just learned from Shasta. The rabbit agreed that this was a very remarkable news and someone ought to tell someone about it with a view to doing something. And so it went on. Every few minutes they were joined by other creatures, some from the branches overhead and some from little underground houses at their feet, till the party consisted of five rabbits, a squirrel, two magpies, a goatfoot fawn, and a mouse, who all talked at the same time and all agreed with the hedgehog. For the truth was that in the golden age, when the witch and the winter had gone and Peter the High King ruled at Caer Paravel, the smaller woodland people of Narnia were so safe and happy that they were getting a little careless. Presently, however, two more practical people arrived in the little wood. One was a red dwarf, whose name appeared to be Duffel. The other was a stag, a beautiful lordly creature with wide liquid eyes, dappled flanks, and legs so thin and graceful they looked as if you could break them with two fingers. I am alive, roared the dwarf as soon as he had heard the news, and if that's so, why are we all standing still chattering? 
Enemies at Anvard? News must be sent to Care Paravel at once. The army must be called out. Narnia must go to the aid of King Loon. Ah, said the hedgehog, but you won't find the High King at the Care. He's away to the north, trouncing those giants. The talking of giants, neighbors, that puts me in mind. Who'll take our message, interrupted the dwarf. Anyone here got more speed than me? I've got speed, said the stag. What's my message, and how many calamines? Two hundred, under Prince Rabidash, and... But the stag was already away, all four legs off the ground at once, and in a moment its white stern had disappeared among the remoter trees. I wonder where he's going, said a rabbit. You won't find the high king at Care Paravel, you know. You'll find Queen Lucy, said Duffel, and then... Hello, what's wrong with the human? It looks pretty green. I do believe it's quite faint. Perhaps it's mortal hungry. When did you last have a meal, youngster? Yesterday morning, said Shasta weakly. Come on, then, come on, said the dwarf, at once throwing his thick little arms around Shasta's waist to support him. My neighbors, we ought all to be ashamed of ourselves. You come with me, lad. Breakfast, better than talking. With a great deal of bustle, muttering reproaches to itself, the dwarf half led and half supported Shasta at a great speed further into the wood and a little downhill. It was a longer walk than Shasta wanted at that moment, and his legs had begun to feel very shaky before they came out from the trees onto a bare hillside. There they found a little house with a smoking chimney and an open door, and as they came to the doorway, Duffel called out, Hey, brothers, a visitor for breakfast. And immediately, mixed with a sizzling sound, there came to Shasta a simply delightful smell. It was one he had never smelled in his life before, but I hope you have. It was, in fact, the smell of bacon and eggs and mushrooms, all frying in a pan. Mind your head, lad, said Duffel, a moment too late, for Shasta had already bashed his forehead against the low lintel of the door. Now, continued the dwarf, sit you down. Table's a bit low for you, but then stool's low too. That's right. And here's porridge. And here's a jug of cream. And here's a spoon. By the time Shasta had finished his porridge, the dwarf's two brothers, whose names were Rogan and Bricklethumb, were putting the dish of bacon and eggs and mushrooms and the coffee pot and the hot milk and the toast on the table. It was all new and wonderful to Shasta, for calamine food is quite different. He didn't even know what the slices of brown stuff were, for he had never seen toast before. He didn't know the soft yellow thing they smeared on the toast was, because in calamine you nearly always get oil instead of butter. And the house itself was quite different from the dark, frowsy, fish-smelling hut of Arshish, and from the pillared and carpeted halls in the palaces of Tashban. The roof was very low. Everything was made of wood. There was a cuckoo clock and a red and white check tablecloth and a bowl of wildflowers and a little white curtain on the thick paneled window. It was also rather troublesome having to use dwarf cups and plates and knives and forks. This meant the helpings were very small, but then there were a great many helpings, so Shasta's plate or cup was being filled every moment, and every moment the dwarfs themselves were saying, butter please, or another cup of coffee, or I'd like a few more mushrooms, or what about frying another egg or two? And when at last they had all eaten as much as they possibly could, the three dwarfs drew lots for who would do the washing up, and Rogan was the unlucky one. Then Duffel and Bricklethumb took Shasta outside to a bench which ran against the cottage wall, and they all stretched out their legs and gave a great sigh of contentment, and the two dwarfs lit their pipes. The dew was off the grass now, and the sun was warm. Indeed, if there hadn't been a light breeze, it would have been too hot. Now, stranger, said Duffel, I'll show you the lie of the land. You can see nearly all South Narnia from here, and we're rather proud of the view. Right away on your left, beyond those hills, you can see the western mountains. And that round hill away on your right is called the Hill of the Stone Table, just beyond... But at that moment he was interrupted by a snore from Shasta, who, what with his night's journey and his excellent breakfast, had gone fast asleep. The kindly dwarfs, as soon as they noticed this, began making signs to each other not to wake him, and indeed they did so much whispering and nodding and getting up and tiptoeing away, they certainly would have waked him if he had been less tired. He slept pretty well nearly all day, but woke up in time for supper. The beds in that house were all too small for him, but they made him a fine bed of heather on the floor, and he never stirred nor dreamed all night. The next morning they had just finished breakfast when they heard a shrill, exciting sound from outside. Trumpets, said all the dwarfs, as they and Shasta all came running out. The trumpets sounded again, a new noise to Shasta, not huge and solemn like the horns of Tashban, nor gay and merry like King Loon's hunting horn, but clear and sharp and valiant. The noise was coming from the woods to the east, and soon there was a noise of horse hoofs mixed with it. A moment later, the head of the column came into sight. 
First came the Lord Peridon on a bay horse carrying the great banner of Narnia, a red lion on a green ground. Shasta knew him at once. Then came three people riding abreast, two on great chargers and one on a pony. The two on the chargers were King Edmund and a fair-haired lady with a very merry face who wore a helmet and mail shirt and carried a bow across her shoulder and a quiver full of arrows at her side. The Queen Lucy, whispered Duffel. But the main one on the pony was Corin, and after that came the main body of the army. Men on ordinary horses, men on talking horses, who didn't mind being ridden on proper occasions, as when Narnia went to war, centaurs, stern, hard-bitten bears, great talking dogs, and last of all, six giants. For there are good giants in Narnia. But though he knew they were on the right side, Shasta at first could hardly bear to look at them. There are some things that take a lot of getting used to. Just as the king and queen reached the cottage, and the dwarfs began making low bows to them, King Edmund called out, Now, friends, time for a halt and a morsel. And at once there was a great bustle of people dismounting and haversacks being opened, conversation beginning, when Corin came running up to Shasta and seized both his hands and cried, What, you here? So you got through all right. I am glad. Now we shall have some sport. And isn't it luck? We only got into harbor at Care Paravel yesterday morning, and the very first person who met us was Chervy the Stag with all this news of an attack on Envard. Don't you think... Who is your highness's friend, said King Edmund, who had just got off his horse. Don't you see, sire, said Corin. It's my double, the boy you mistook me for at Tashban. Why, so he is your double, exclaimed Queen Lucy, as like as two twins. This is a marvelous thing. Please, your majesty, said Shasta to King Edmund. I was no traitor. Really, I wasn't. I couldn't help hearing your plans, but I'd never have dreamed of telling them to your enemies. I know now that you were no traitor, boy, said King Edmund, laying his hand on Shasta's head. But if you would not be taken for one another time, try not to hear what's meant for other ears. But all's well. After that, there was so much bustle and talk and coming and going that Shasta, for a few minutes, lost sight of Corin and Edmund and Lucy. But Corin was the sort of boy whom one is sure to hear of pretty soon, and it wasn't very long before Shasta heard King Edmund saying in a loud voice, by the lion's mane, prince, this is too much. Will your highness never be better? You are more of a heart scald than our whole army together. I'd as lief have a regiment of hornets in my command as you. Shasta wormed his way through the crowd, and there saw Edmund looking very angry indeed, Corin looking a little ashamed of himself, and a strange dwarf sitting on the ground making faces. A couple of fawns had apparently just been helping it out of its armor. If I had but my cordial with me, Queen Lucy was saying, I could soon mend this, but the High King has so strictly charged me not to carry it commonly to the wars and to keep it only for great extremities. What had happened was this. As soon as Corrin had spoken to Shasta, Corrin's elbow had been plucked by a dwarf in the army called Thornbutt. What is it, Thornbutt? Corrin had said. Your Royal Highness, said Thornbutt, drawing him aside, our march today will bring us through the path and right to your royal father's castle. We may be in battle before night. I know, said Corrin. Isn't it splendid? Splendid or not, said Corrin, Thornbutt, I have the strictest orders from King Edmund to see to it that your highness is not in the fight. You will be allowed to see it, and that's treat enough for your highness's years. Oh, what nonsense, Corrin burst out. Of course I'm going to fight. Why, Queen Lucy's going to be with the archers. The Queen's Grace will do as she pleases, said Thornbud, but you are in my charge. Either I must have your solemn and princely word that you'll keep your pony beside mine, not half a neck ahead, till I give your highness leave to depart, or else, it is his majesty's word, we must go with our wrists tied together like two prisoners. I'll knock you down if you try to bind me, said Corrin. I'd like to see your highness do it, said the dwarf. That was quite enough for a boy like Corrin, and in a second he and the dwarf were at it hammer and tongs. It would have been an even match, for though Corrin had longer arms and more height, the dwarf was older and tougher. But it was never fought out. That's the worst of fights on a rough hillside, for by very bad luck Thornbutt trut, trot on a loose stone, came down flat on his nose, and found when he tried to get up that he had sprained his ankle, a real excruciating sprain which would keep him from walking or riding for at least a fortnight. See what your highness has done, said King Edmund, deprived us of a proved warrior on the very edge of battle. I'll take his place, sire, said Corin. Pfft, said Edmund, no one doubts your courage, but a boy in battle is a danger only to his own side. At that moment, the king was called away to attend to something else, and Corin, after apologizing handsomely to the dwarf, 
rushed up to Shasta and whispered, Quick, there's a spare pony now in the dwarf's armor. Put it on before anyone notices. What for? said Shasta. Why, so you and I can fight in the battle, of course. Don't you want to? Uh, 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 yeah, of course, said Shasta. But he hadn't been thinking of doing so at all and began to get a most uncomfortable prickly feeling in his spine. That's right, said Corin, over your head. Now the sword belt. But we must ride near the tail of the column and keep as quiet as mice. Once the battle begins, everyone will be far too busy to notice us. And that's the end of chapter 12.